graduates Straight to the league, I ain't waiting for my knee to blow Yesterday I was needing this dough Get it? I was needing this dough Okay. Hello. What's up? Boy, you're sharp too. You're looking good. You're looking good. You're looking good. Not every day I get to sit down with the magic man. Well, you know, we gonna do it. Exactly. We're gonna let it do what it do. Yes, sir. So Magic, appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you. This show needing though, literally, you are the godfather, the reason why this show exists, the reason why we created this show at Uninterrupted was the idea I'd always heard. All the media talks about how athletes go broke. And I just got sick of it. Yep. Where I want to start is kind of growing up. And how did you get your mindset? You grew up, obviously, in Lansing with nine siblings. Yep. Six, nine si siblings. six sisters, three brothers. My thing was, here I am, the tallest and the youngest. And when you're poor, clothes get passed down. down. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm wearing high waters to school. It was uh, something, you know, but I tell you, I'm glad I grew up in a big family because the love was there. Even though we were poor, we, we made it work. It was a lot of love in the family, in the home. And growing up, what was it like in your house? Your parents both worked. What was it like? My father worked for General Motors for 30 years. Yep. And uh, I really took a lot from him because he worked 30 years and won an award after he retired for never being late and never missing a day in 30 wow. years. Wow, in 30 years? In 30 years. And then my mother worked for the school cafeteria. And did your parents ever talk about their, the financial situation you guys were in or going through or what they wanted for you guys financially or anything like that? As a kid, you, you really didn't know you were poor. You just, you know. Everybody else. Everybody was the same. So uh, my father really... I would say he really helped me understand money because he worked not only at General Motors, he also had a trash hauling service. Oh, wow. So we pick up people's trash. So he was an entrepreneur. Oh, yeah. So that yeah. was your first time you seen what an entrepreneur is. Exactly. My dad was hustling, you know, and then in the summer, I worked on a truck every single day, but Sunday. He was hustling, so it made me have a hustler's mentality, yeah. too, yeah. because I seen him do it. Now... I think what happened for me was truly a blessing because Lansing is a small town. So I got a chance to see two men who were who looked like me, who were black. And they were entrepreneurs, owned buildings, owned uh, multiple companies. And so one day I got bold and I asked them for a job. And so they said, all right, come on. They own so many buildings. They said, this is going to be your building that you have to clean. From Friday after 5 o'clock to Sunday, you clean this building and we'll pay you. Seven floors. So I used to, you know, go one through six. And I get to the seventh floor. That was a, that's where the CEO's office was. Yeah. And, man, man, I would bust in the door like I was the CEO. Like you own the joint. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretending. Like yeah. I'm the man, right? Yeah. And so I would go, recline his seat, put my feet up like that on the <laughs> desk, hit the intercom button, pretend I had an assistant out front, yeah. bring me the coffee and donuts, uh, Elisa. <laughs> <laughs> and here I am in this office for hours, dreaming, dreaming. that I was a CEO. How old were you at the time? 16 years Unbelievable. old. Unbelievable. And you know what's crazy? And I tell this to young people all the time. If you don't dream it, you can't become it. You can't it. become it. You, you, you just can't. So you got to put yourself there. You got to think that it's achievable, that you can achieve and attain this, right? And so that's what got me started, man. Those two guys, they became my first mentors wow. right there. Obviously, you went to Michigan State. You're all American. You knew at that point basketball was going to be what, how I'm going to make my living. But at our company, I interrupted, we talk about our motto is, I am more than an athlete. Mm -hmm. At some point, I don't know if it's when you got to the NBA or Michigan State, you realize I'm more than an athlete. I can make a living and make a good living right. playing the NBA, but I got to show the world I'm more than this. When did that I am more than an athlete feeling come to you? After my rookie season, a deal came to me. 
a radio station in uh, Colorado. Yep. So you're in at the Lakers. You finish your second year. Mm-hmm. My my major was telecommunications. Got it. So I already knew the radio because I was a DJ in college. That's how oh. I made my hustle. Oh really? In, you, at while you played State. ball, your job in Michigan State was a DJ to party. Oh yeah, all oh, so the you, clubs, everything, everything. EJ the DJ. <laughs> <laughs> That's still real. Oh, <laughs> ma'am, I was turning them out, baby. I was turning them Your out. Your party is on full. Ooh, a line outside the door to I get it rocking. Let's come see your boy. I had a room, a, a dude right next to me and in the dorm was from Rochester, New York. His dad and a brother. His dad owned a radio station in, in Rochester. Rochester. I walked into his room. He had all the turntables set up. Oh, so he was practicing, so when he went home... He could work on the station. Exactly. So I said, man, teach me how to spin and how to bring the song in and all that. Man, I, was, man, I used to sit in there for hours, man, just practicing. And when I got it down, Bonnie and Clyde's, all the clubs in Lansing, I went... You played them. Up here. EJ at, the DJ. EJ the That's DJ. That's amazing. <laughs> Boy, I had so much fun. So you knew that that's amazing. So by the time you get to the Lakers, a radio station called come with a deal. You had already been in that world. Exactly. So Dr. Red, African American uh, professor at Michigan State, head of telecommunications at Michigan State at that time. I got a call from this guy that said, "Hey, Irvin, if you buy the radio station at that time as an African American, you could get it cheaper." Got it. So I said, cool. So we went, vetted the deal. I took Dr. Red, I called him up, took him with me. Smart. See, See that's a smart thing that young yes. athletes don't always do. Exactly. You knew a mentor, you knew a guy who knows this. You're not going to be Mr. Smarty Pants. No. I'm going to get somebody who really knows exactly. it. Exactly. And come with me. Come with me. You know the business. So he made a great deal for us. Bought the radio station. It takes you two years we went from we wanted to go from an AM to the FM yep. because th- they're more valuable. Yep. Go for more money. We did that, converted it over to an FM, sold it, made you know two three million dollar profit. I was good. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when you flip for you like, oh, this I get it now. I get it now, right? Said okay, this is what I want to do. Besides just being a basketball player. I want to be a businessman too. Yeah. Especially that first deal is all if it's sweet like that. Oh, it's the best. Then you just go, you go. from there. Yeah. You go from there. Exactly. And you grew up in Lansing, then went to college in Lansing. Yeah. And then they drop you in Hollywood. They drop you in LA. <laughs> what was that like? I mean, because you had spent basically your first, you know, 19, 20 years of your life in uh, as home. you said, a little small city in Lansing. You went to visit some places, probably played ball, but you had never lived anywhere else. And then you went, you were from zero to 100 <laughs> yeah, real quick. Yeah. <laughs> Culture shock. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Well, first of all, I was so scared, man, of the city that my first year, I actually stayed in, a, in my apartment the whole time. Did you really? And it, it was just a whole difference, this big, big city. And I said, you know what? Let me do the first thing I need to do, which was become a great basketball player. Smart. And, you know, God bless us with the fact that we won that first year. But i tell you what I did, and it made a lot of athletes upset and a lot of my teammates upset. It was an unwritten rule at that time, you don't befriend the owner. Of course. So Because it was like players versus organizations. That's right. right. That's right. So here I am, 19 years old, all the way from Lansing, Michigan, Dr. Buss saw that, that I was this, he, he, they would all ask me, what you gonna do? I said, I'm going to the apartment. I, I don't know how to get around LA. I, I'm scared to death. So he said, won't you start, well, come to go to dinner. Let's start going to lunch. I'll take you to lunch every day. I said, cool. cool. So I start going to lunch and dinner with him. Meet me here or I'll come pick you up. And we befriended each other. So he used to ask me, what do you want to do after basketball? I said, that early? That early. I said, I want to become a businessman. <clears throat> and so he didn't really say nothing. He just like took a mental note of it. <clears throat> when I got hurt, 
the next year, he said, this is a good time for you to really start reading up, getting prepared. So I'm going to take you through the books. I'm going to explain the Laker business to you, the real business. Wow. Yeah. Took me through what season ticket holders mean, what sponsorships mean, what the radio contract mean, what the TV contract means. I'm sitting up there, wow. wow. So he just became a father figure and a mentor all at the same time. And it's amazing also that Dr. Buss did that because I'm right. talking about 1979 for owner to take players in and kind of help. Was that was that natural back then? Were there other owners around the league who did that that you knew of? No, it was against the owners' rules and the players', <laughs> and the players rules. Exactly. <laughs> so we both <laughs> were breaking, <laughs> breaking rules. Both crossing barriers. Exactly. Exactly. And you you have to remember he was a game changer anyway. The Laker girls, first dancing team, yeah. right? So he wanted to be the first. He wanted to be a pioneer. And Form he was. club. Was Form the... club. He, his thought process, he was a visionary. He was way out front. Mm -hmm. And he didn't care what people said. And this is the one thing I want people to realize about Dr. Buss. He didn't see color. That's awesome. See, he didn't see color. He didn't care. If you can get the job done, he with you. you good. How did you deal with your teammates in the locker room who saw this as like, what are you doing? You crossing the line. How did you deal with that? Maverick, that was difficult because sure. they they uh, didn't like it. And I had to explain to them, I don't care what you guys think. I'm going to hang with Dr. Buss. Uh, I'm not doing anything wrong. I'm not saying what you know happens in the locker room or what happens on the bus or the planes. We're talking business. Yep. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready for my life after basketball. And I'll tell you another thing that happened. I would be on the bus saying, I'm going to be a businessman after I'm done. And the guys would laugh, you know, like, you're not going to be no businessman. And now they see me and said, man, Irvin, all the things you <laughs> talked about. That's right. That's right. Everything you said. Everything you said. You're doing it right now. Of course, now. of course. Yeah. And I owe a lot of it to Dr. Bus first, Peter Gruber second. Yep. And then the third guy would be Michael Ovitz. Yep because he was the biggest Hollywood agent at that time. Yep. And so I went to see Michael. This is, this is good for all athletes. So I'm sitting there, a lot of actors and coming producers, in. And everybody coming in and out. And I'm like, man, look at all these guys, you know, people I know, right? Wow. So I'm sitting there, it's one hour, and then it's two hours, then it's about two and a half hours, and then finally they come get me. I sit down like we're sitting here. He says, uh, why should I represent you? You know, all you athletes, all you do is spend more money than you make and you go broke. And I was like, wow. He said, well, let me think about it. Nice to meet you. We were in there all of five minutes. Wow. And he did all the talking. And I said, uh, man, did we have a meeting? <laughs> Man, I went in six nine. I think I came out by five nine. <laughs> I said, "What just happened?" So I get on the phone. I said, "I don't think he liked me." <laughs> so, so a week later, he calls me back. He said, I've, "I've done my homework on you, and everybody I talked to said you've been saying you want to be a businessman since you've been in Los Angeles." He said, I want you to come back in and meet me. I wow. Said, okay. So I came back to see him. He said, all right, what's the first part of the paper you read? I said, of course, the sports page. Wrong answer. You want to be a businessman, you got to read the business section. So this is what I want you to do. Here's 10 magazines. He gave me the Wall Street Journal, all these different papers and magazines. You read them all. I'm going to call you and quiz you if you read every article. And if you've done that, then I'm going to take you on. Wow. So, man, I, I left out of there, and I read them all. Everything. Like, everything in a day. Because I, I was serious, right? Yeah. He called me back, answered all his questions. He took me on. And, man, he did a Pepsi deal for me that was unbelievable. Didn't take no money. Wow. He just helped just he to put, show you the what? Exactly. Talked about earlier being on the bus with teammates and having the conversation of your aspirations. And 
when I first started in the sports business with LeBron, we had aspirations. Mm -hmm. And we had opposition, other players, other guys looking at us going, you know, why aren't you guys doing this? And I remember I would come in the game with a suit on because I wanted to be taken serious. Right. I always told people, I wanted to be taken serious long after LeBron was done playing. Exactly. I wanted to be my own person if I needed a job because hell, who knows what LeBron wants to do yep. when he's retiring. And facing that opposition, it's, it is gratifying later when some of those people come up to me and say, you know what, you were right. How Was that one of the more gratifying things that you had when, when some of those teammates and other players come to you then and say, you know, or if we should have actually been on your path? Yeah, yeah, it, it was. And also, too, I'm glad that I didn't listen to anybody. Yep. And the same for, for you and, and, and LeBron and Rich, of course. All you guys are doing your thing. And see, if you had to listen to them, you wouldn't be sitting here right now. Exactly. Right? You wouldn't own this company. So I love the fact that you're sitting here because we, we were on similar paths, yep. right? We had to change athletes' mindset that, yeah, we can excel on the court and on the field, but also we can excel and be more in, yep. in, as a CEO or in yep. the business room. So we busted those doors open, right? And so a lot of times what happens as athletes or as minorities, we hurt ourselves because we think we can't achieve that. Exactly. It's not for us. It's not for us. You know, it's, it's out of our reach. Yep. Or, or we don't want to go through what it takes to get, get there. there. <laughs> yeah. And I was a dude to say, oh, show me the way. You'll read whatever, I'll work. Just I'll show I'll work. Me. Just show me. All I need is the roadmap. Yep. Then the greatest moment came when I really had to say, this is what really stamped me as a serious businessman, the deal with Starbucks. Yeah, of course. Because that deal changed everything. Before I was doing deals, yep. But this one was a, a, a it's all over the country. Yep. Uh, we built 125 stores. Wow. We made that deal happen. And that's what really put me on a path of success. I, I, and I'm talking big business. Yep, of course. Right? It showed everybody that I could drive ROI in urban America. When you think about African Americans now, you know, over a trillion dollar spending power. Latinos over a trillion dollar spending power and, and moving even higher. <clears throat> there was nobody really building businesses in nobody our harnessing it. going after their disposable income. Yep. Right. And so and also bringing things to them that they want and need right. and jobs. That's right? right. Jobs. So we so my company was able to provide jobs, access, like you just said to these retailers who were not coming in before, but now they hit a home run when we partnered and they came into the inner city. And going back to basketball for a second, when I was a kid, I really rooted for the Lakers. And I rooted for the Lakers very simply because the Lakers felt like the black team, it was showtime, it was fun. Their best players, Nick, he had a nickname, like guys in my neighborhood had a nickname, like Magic. <laughs> so he felt like he was from my hood. Exactly. And Boston felt like, the white team, yep. it was Boston, the yep. style they played, Mikhail, mm -hmm. and their best player mm -hmm. was this blonde hair, kind of tall white guy. But at that time, you were obviously, Dr. Jerry Buss had taught you the business of sports, mm -hmm. you said earlier. Mm -hmm. Did you really understand that the story of the Lakers and Celtics, Magic and Bird, it was actually better, you couldn't write a better story to make right. basketball the marketing of the game mm -hmm. as big as it did. Did you realize what was going on? Were you just like, I'm trying to beat the Celtics and win the championship? Or were you like, this is really cool. That I understand that it's really storytelling. Yeah. It, it, in the beginning, you didn't know. But as you got older and start playing them. Yeah. Uh, 84, we started. Then we played them again in 85. We knew that the country was divided. <laughs> <laughs> You knew, you, knew, you knew it was a little black boy in Acker rooting for the Lakers. All the blacks for the Lakers, all the whites for the Celtics. And it was cool, you know. And the thing about it was um, basketball and the NBA was better because Larry Bird ended up in Boston. I 100%. ended up in I always want to ask you that. Do you think you and Bird were the two best players in the league? If Larry played for 
Minnesota and you played for Seattle and y'all, it, it wouldn't, wouldn't have been, been the same. It wouldn't have, no. y'all still would have been fighting for championships, yeah. but it wouldn't, wouldn't have, been have been the same, same. right? No, it was perfect. And and David Stern did his thing, the commissioner at the yeah. time. So we got to give him credit. And so that's what it's all about. You have to have rivalries and you have to have superstars. To tell the story. To tell the story. And as, to talk about that also, obviously, Dr. Buzz gave you a 25-year, $25 million deal at the time, the biggest deal mm-hmm. we had ever seen. What what were you thinking when you did that deal? And 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 what did the first check when you got it? What did you do with it? What did you think about it? <laughs> man, brains back chills even thinking about it. <laughs> man, he put that check in my hand and, and my hand just kept shaking. And I kept looking and I and I said, all them zeros. And I really, Dr. Buddy. Really? I said, really? <laughs> really? I'm sitting there like, I cannot believe I, I'll never catch. I got to have so I can put it. So it's, I got one at my mom's house right now, the, you know, a million dollars. I, I just was just blown away. And what was crazy is he said, Irvin, I'm going to make you the highest paid ever. I'm going to give you $25 million for 25 years. Now, this is my second year. I said, what? Oh. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> of course, let's go. It's just him and I. Like, I said, I'll take it. So he said, okay, well, I'll call your representative. we work out the deals. I just wanted to come to you. I didn't want to call them. I wanted to come, come to, to you. you. And so that's how our, our relationship was. It was amazing that, again, thinking outside the box, didn't care what nobody thought, because all the owners was upset at him for giving me that deal. I'm sure, because it raised the market. That's right. And then my players... They were upset. They too. were upset with your relationship. Yeah. And then it comes 91, you obviously retire. You now you have HIV. Yep. How did that affect you as a businessman? Did it have an effect on endorsements or investments or business? It did have an effect. Uh, the companies that were sponsoring me at that time, I had a lot of sponsors, they all dropped me. Really? Mm-hmm. Right away. Right away. So now I said, okay, what are you going to do, Urban? And so before, I, for the first, I would say, six months, I was really upset. I was uh, frustrated. I was saying, man, how did this happen to me, right? My wife came home one day, and she changed my life. She said, you was talked about being a businessman. So it's time for you to start thinking about getting into business. So get out the house. And don't come back until you you become the man that I married. Wow. And I was like, wow. So I went and drove for two or three hours. And sure enough, man, I started moving, start calling people. And that's when I, I just started exploding, man. My business career just really jump-started. And the one thing that really helped it jump-start, too, was uh, I tried to be a TV talk show host. Talk show. The magic hour. <laughs> yes. And uh whew, I failed. How long did that last? Shoot, less than a year, brother. And was you doing it because you really wanted to be a talk show host? Or why did you do what made you do the magic? I hour? think both. I wanted to see how it was and also put me back in the mainstream. Yeah, give you a platform. Exactly. Yeah. And I was terrible. Yeah. And sometimes you have to take self-evaluation of, of yourself. And I said, man. I can't do this. Yeah. But it did help me too at the same time. I had a speech coach who really helped me to pronunciate words better for the show. Yeah. But now it's carried on in my life. In life, exactly. See, so some things I'm, I might have uh, failed at being a talk show host, but it helped me in everyday life. Got it. At the same time. So I gained something from it. Yep. Uh, and then I'm glad it happened because that's when Starbucks, everything came right From after that, that. Right after that. So it was great. And did you did you see yourself failing or did somebody come to you and say, Matt, this ain't working? No, no, I knew. You knew? I knew. I knew. You know, you, you were being real with yourself. Exactly. I, I'm not I'm not that guy who um sit there and say, Oh, I'm great at something and I know I'm not. Gotcha. I'm the guy who say, Oh man, I stink. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I know that. I know I can't do that. So let's move on to something Let's move on. Yeah. So so I got fired on Friday. I was back in my office on Monday. 
making back things to work. happen. Back to work. Hey, I gave myself one day on Saturday to cry. Went to church on Sunday. Pick it back Back up. to work Let's on Monday. Let's go That's make awesome. it happen. And then in, in 94, you became an owner of the mm -hmm. Lakers. Mm -hmm. Was that always an aspiration and a dream to own a piece of a club? No question about it. Because Maverick, remember then, there was no minorities and no Zero. Sports. Yeah, you were the first. It was yeah, none. So, it uh, wasn't even a thought that no, a player, no. when you did it, the fact that a player could become an owner was like, that don't even, to your point earlier, that don't even make sense. That don't make sense. I went to him, Dr. Buss again. He said, Irvin, I would do it, but you're going to have to pay for it. I said, no, no. Just tell me I saved all my money. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm good. so I got to tell you this quick story that a lot of people don't even know. Matter of fact, this would be the first time I tell it. So Dr. Buss loved Vegas. So we used to go to Vegas all the time in the off season. I mean, like once a week. Got it. So we fly in and um, he used to uh, get his own table. So he would say, come sit with me. I said, no, no, no. I said, I'm not going to sit next to you. I'm going to sit behind you. I'm going to be the most expensive cheerleader you've ever had. <laughs> so he said, no, no, I got all this money. You, you come and play. I said, no. So he said, no, take the chips. I said, okay, cool. So I take the chip and put it in my pocket. So I'm sitting there. He playing. And man, he was an unbelievable gambler. You know, He did very well. So this is Friday. So we go back on Saturday. He said, come on and play. I said, no. So he gave me all these chips. I put them in my pocket. So we play again all Saturday night. Sunday come. We... Yeah, come play. All these chips. So by the time we leave on Monday, <laughs> shoot, I got me about 20,000, 25,000 in my pocket. Right? And the chips you just been stacking. You just been stacking. <laughs> I was stacking. So, so, so he, was, he was dying. He was dying. I went to the hospital. Jeannie called me, said he wants to say goodbye to me. So I went there. He said, you know what impressed me about you? Now, he's in, laying in the bed. He said, we used to go gambling. And I thought I was doing something, giving you some money. And I look up and you put it all in your pocket. <laughs> you just stacked it all. I said, Dr. Buzz, I grew up poor. <laughs> I hold on to my I hold on to my I am not no gambler. But he fell out laughing. Even in his bed, he said, that's why I loved you. And I knew you were going to be successful. That's amazing. He said, I knew you were going to be successful. That's why also I led you into the Lakers. You were always an outstanding young man. Yep. When I told you to be there at 4 o'clock, you were there at 3 o'clock. When I told you you had to meet the bankers and come say hi, take pictures, you were there yeah. doing that. Everything I asked you to do, you was there. That's why I let you in and you could write a check. You were ready to do so it. So I was ready to do it because at that time, it was a $10 million check. Exactly. It was just Cash a huge money. check. Yeah. Oh, and man. And people don't that understand time. that part. That's a big part about business being prepared when the opportunity shows that's yourself. Right. That's you right. You were ready to write that check. Just think ready. that opportunity coming, you don't get the check. That's a great opportunity that passed you by. Passed by and wouldn't have opened the door for other minorities, for to Mike. Get the ownership. Or, uh, all these other guys to come in yep. and, and get to be an owner. So, so. For me, it was great. And that's another lesson for all these people. Save your money. Yep. Don't spend more than you make, athletes and entertainers. Yep. And then after the Lakers, you obviously set precedent again by buying the partnership, being in partnership with the Dodgers. Yeah. How did you get into that? And why did you do great it? Great story, Maverick. I, I, you know, it's funny, Maverick. It's like LA fan base wanted some local ownership. And... So here I am saying, hey, I want to be one of the owners. So these all these billionaires start calling me, say, I want to partner with you. So Maverick, I'm interviewing six billionaires to buy. You're them. interviewing them. I'm to be interviewing your them. Exactly. And I'm like, wow, I've come a long way <laughs> from Full last week, Michigan, singing temptation <laughs> songs on the street corner. DJ the DJ. DJ the DJ spinning the records. Now I'm interviewing six billionaires. <laughs> oh, man, man. Man, my life was so good at that time. So finally, Mark Walters came in and uh, Guggenheim 
and Mark and I hit it off. It was instant, you know, we just connected. And I said, that's who I want to be in business with. But I said to Mark, I said, listen, I just don't want to do this deal with you. I want to do 10 deals with you. And he said, let's do it then. So we end up winning, paid a record uh, price for the Dodgers, over $2 billion. And people were like, wow, they couldn't believe the price tag. But we knew the TV deal was coming up and now it's nine billion. The land that the Dodger Stadium sit on, the 300 acres are worth over $2 billion. Exactly. You know, and so it was a, a deal that we couldn't pass up. So this has been an amazing run, man. And uh, I'm looking for game changing deals. I don't want to do a regular deal. If it's a game changer or it's somebody I say, hey, man, Mav, you and I should partner. See, somebody like yourself, yep. then I would do it, right? Of course. Because you got some, I got some. That's how you explode, yep. right? Two people with great brands and yep. coming together to do some great things. So that's what I'm looking for. And, and and it's so funny because you and I got a major problem. And I want to address these cameras because this is important. See, everybody get mad now when you and I say no. Yeah. Well, like I got to teach everybody. Okay. When I was at this level, yeah, I could deal with you. <laughs> But I'm not at that level no more. See, I, I went here, then I went here. Now I'm here. So the deal's got to be the here. got to match. <laughs> exactly. And, and no, I'm not hating. Yeah. Everybody don't be mad at me when I say no. Yeah. But the deal's got to be here. Of course. I tell you, you can learn a lot from billionaires. They said the same amount of time it takes to make a million dollars is the same amount of time to make a hundred million dollars. Of course. I've time. been putting that in my mind. Time is the key. <laughs> time is the key. And it, every deal takes time from you. It takes that's magic right. getting on the exactly. phone, calling people. Exactly. So it might as well be a deal that's going to make you a hundred million, not a million dollars. Ooh, we just taught you guys something. <laughs> <laughs> Last question before I let you go. Now this is this is unbelievable when I think about you. You are arguably the greatest basketball player to ever play the game. All the accomplishments, five championships, finals, MVPs, MVPs, all of that. And there's a chance you get remembered more as a businessman or as much as a basketball player because there's a whole generation of, of young African-Americans who look up to Magic Johnson and never seen you make a no-look pass. They never even seen right. you drop it off to Kareem or hit the baby hook. They don't even know that. They've maybe seen a, a highlight of it. They have no idea, but they look up to you as an entrepreneur. Yep. At the end of the day, what do you want Irvin Magic Johnson to be known as? The greatest basketball player or an incredible businessman? Which one would, would you want to be known for? I think, I think the businessman and all the kids we've sent to college through the Magic Johnson Foundation, the technology centers that we built around the country through the Magic Johnson Foundation, those are the things that I want to be remembered by. The kids sending to college, the business, uh, the businesses, and the job opportunity for our people and for my people, right? And for Latinos as well. So that's very, very important because that's the real legacy, right? There's, there's always going to be great basketball players, right? I, I want to be known for the guy who created jobs for those who live in urban America. That's what I want to be known for. And so uh, uh, God is good, man. I'm, this is, I'm glad we sat down because we did this, too. this is different from anybody else I've interviewed because you're also doing what I'm doing. And I've never had a, a situation like this. So this has been great. And it's going to show a lot of people um, that we can make it and make Absolutely. it big and do great things all at the same time. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Oh, Thank you for coming on. I don't know how, I don't even know how they're going to edit this. Yeah. I don't know either. They're going to play around. There's going to be a lot of shows. Exactly. There's got to be about three or four shows. <laughs>